Praise God. We're in a series and we're talking about the flesh, the enemy to destiny. The flesh, the enemy to destiny. And I'm really enjoying this series because I know where I'm going and I know what it's going to lead to. But I hope that so far up until now, you've really gotten a hold of what we're trying to share and what we're trying to minister to you. And I hope that it's being a blessing to you. And uh, it's going, if you will open your ears in this series and listen, I'm telling you, your life uh, could, could dramatically change. So thank you so much for coming to church. Thank you for making it out on a Sunday morning. I know there are so many other things you can do, but you came out this Sunday to hear the word of God. And I am so very thankful for all of you being here and all of you online. Amen. All right. So this morning we're going to be on part. Uh, this is probably part three or four. I, I, I can't remember if this is our third week talking about the flesh or our fourth week. I'm prone to believe it's our fourth week talking about the flesh. And we're still in the foundation laying mode. OK, we're still in the foundation laying mode. And the reason why it's taking us so long uh, laying the foundation is because a subject like this there's a lot of tradition and uh, wrong, erroneous thoughts, views, or paradigms concerning this subject. Many people believe, many Christian people believe, in fact, uh, we see it in our Bibles. We showed you last week that in the, a lot of the translations, they'll have the headers at the top of each of the sections. And when they start talking about the flesh, they'll describe it as saying the believers two natures the two natures that we have remember we look where we saw that two natures and so theologians are misunderstood on this subject uh, believers worldwide globally not just here in the united states but globally they're confused with regard to this subject and i'm telling you if you miss it on this subject you're going to you're going to miss it big time in life. You're going to veer off into a place where you don't want to end up. OK. And so uh, so we're, we're still in the foundation laying mode today in the name of Jesus. It'll be our last Sunday of foundation laying. You know, I was in New Jersey, too. Uh, I think two weeks ago, we can. We, I don't know. I was in New Jersey last time. I was there and I took about two and a half hours, two hours and 20 minutes to lay it out there. Um, so, so, but you know, I don't have that long here. And so we're gonna get it out today. Once I get started, I'll preach for one hour. We're gonna get the message out today and it's going to really set us up for what we're gonna look at in the weeks to come. But you don't wanna miss this foundation part. That's what I'm trying to hammer in. This is vital because if you don't get the foundation, then everything else we build on top of this foundation, you're gonna, it's just gonna go way over your head. And you're not gonna be able to connect it. And I don't wanna lose you, okay? I want us to all get on the same bus at the same time and get to the same destiny together, amen? Amen, amen. praise the Lord. So I'm gonna get started right now. I'm gonna set my timer for one hour. If you have your Bibles, please open with me to our foundation text we've been using. It's three verses, Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 7. We're going to look at some scriptures this morning, and uh, it might be a little more than maybe what you're used to looking at, but it's all necessary and all needed. So just follow along with me, and uh, we're going to get to a place this morning. We're going to talk about this. If you're taking notes, you can subtitle this, What Happens When You Allow the Flesh to Live? What? Yeah, amen. That's right, Marvin. Bad things. That's a great response. What happens when you allow the flesh to live? We want to show you that this morning. Amen. So look with me, Romans chapter 8, verse 5 through 7. He says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. And they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, now he's using carnal interchangeably with flesh. Everybody see that? In verse 5 he called it flesh. In verse 6 he called it 
carnal. Everybody see that? To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, how many of you want life and peace? Okay, how many of you want death? <laughs> Good. If you want life and peace, listen, you have to be spiritual, spiritually minded. If you want death, which none of you said you did, nonetheless, I have to say it as a disclaimer, if you want death, then you, of course you need to be carnally minded or let the flesh live. And if the flesh is living in your life, you're going to get results that you don't want to get. All right, now, I want you to look with me. Let's keep reading verse 6. He says, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now, why? Look at this. This is very interesting. What is the flesh? Is it a friend or a foe? Amen. Good job. Friend or foe? Friend or foe? That's what we need to, every morning, every day when we wake up, we need to take the position we need to recognize what the flesh is. Friend or foe, state your biz. Right? Where do you stand? We need to know. Look at what the Bible tells you the flesh is. Watch this. The carnal mind is an enemy or it's enmity. I like that word enmity. We don't really use that word today. In our, it's not really a part of our vernacular or our, um, our talk today. But it is still a word that is commonly used uh, in many circles. And the word enmity is very strong because it does denote hostility. Of course, an enemy. But it, it goes a little deeper than that when the Bible uses it. It's referring to a clear enemy. A clear enemy. Meaning there is no doubt where the flesh is. It's not your friend. Amen? It's a clear enemy. Now, the, 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 the flesh has a, uh, 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 two desires, two things that it wants to accomplish in your life. Obviously, being an enemy, as you said, Marvin, those things are not good. Because it's our enemy, the things that it wants to accomplish are not good things. They are bad things. Amen? Now, let's deal with this, and I know that uh, we've, we've touched on this some uh, every week so far, but I want to hit this again to make sure that it's solidified. What is the flesh? We have three points today. What is the flesh? How do we allow the flesh to live? And what happens when we allow the flesh to live? Those are our three points. So real quickly, let's hit this in review. What is the flesh? Romans chapter 7 verses 14 through 20 tell us clearly that the flesh is our sin nature prior to being born again. Prior to being born again. So before you and I got saved, we had a sin nature. The Bible refers to that sin nature as the flesh. Okay, now just, just follow me step by step. So before you got saved, what did you have? A sin nature. That sin nature in the Bible is referred to as the flesh. Everybody with me, right? Let me show you that. Romans 7, 14 through 20. You're in Romans 8, one chapter back. Romans 7, verse 14 through 18. Watch this. For we know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, I am sold under sin, or I'm a slave to sin. It's my master. This is before he's born again. Verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not, but what I hate, I'm still doing it. Now why? It's because he has a sin nature. We're going to find this out. Verse 16, if then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, then it is no more I that do it. Now watch, but sin 
that dwells in me. Stop right here. What is dwelling in Paul? At the, he's not born again right now. In chapter 7, he's not born again yet. Of course, he's born again when he writes the letter, but he's reflecting on where he was before he got saved. Now, what's dwelling in Paul uh, at this point? According to, to, to the Bible, what's dwelling in Paul? Sin. Sin is the sin nature. He's referring to the sin nature. The sin nature is dwelling in Paul. Now, notice what he calls the sin nature. Look at verse uh, 18. For I know that in me, stop. I know that in me, what did he say in verse 17 was dwelling in me? Sin. Look at what he calls the sin nature now in verse 18. For I know that in me, watch this, that is my flesh. Are you seeing how he's using the sin nature interchangeably with the term the flesh? Can everybody see that? In my flesh or in the sin nature, there is what? No good thing. Amen? For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that which I would not or that I don't want to do, it's no more I doing it. Watch this. He comes back to the sin nature. Look at this. But sin, somebody shout the nature, that dwells in me. So what was dwelling in you prior to the born again experience? The sin nature, which is also called the flesh. Everybody with me? Okay, now, when you got saved, when you were born again, when you accepted Jesus, this is why someone says, well, why do I have to be born again? Because the first time you were born, you were born with a sin nature. You have to be born again with a righteous nature. Are you with me? That's why you are born again. Your first birth, you were born in sin, shaping in iniquity, Psalm 51. When you are reborn in Christ, you are now born with a perfectly righteous and holy nature. Amen. 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 Now, the flesh, listen to me closely, the flesh was crucified. We're talking about the sin nature. The flesh was crucified and destroyed the moment you were born again. I'm going to give you two verses. Last week I gave you three or four. I'll give you two this week. Go to Galatians 5 and 1. Everybody put their eyes on this. Galatians 5, 24. Galatians 5, 24. Praise God. Hallelujah. So good to see everybody this morning. So glad you guys are here. Amen. Those of you online, we're so thankful for all of you. Look at this. Galatians 5, 24. The sin nature, the flesh... The sin nature, the flesh, the sin nature, the flesh was crucified at salvation. It's dead. All right, now watch this. Verse 24. And they that are Christ's possessive. How many of you belong to? To Christ. Let me see your hand. Hi, those of you online, if you belong to Christ, let wave your hand. You belong to Christ. Now look at what the Bible says happened to everyone who belonged to Christ. Possessive. Look at this. You have crucified the flesh with, with the affections, meaning the things it loves, and the lust, the things it desires. It's crucified. Let me show you one more verse, Romans 6. Go back to Romans 6. Again, I'm taking you through these verses of Scripture because if you've, if, if, if you've been in church for any semblance of time, you know that this is a very, very uh, ambiguous subject. It's very misunderstood as well. Okay? So look at Romans 6 and verse 6. Watch this. Knowing this, that our old man, 
is crucified. Stop. In Galatians 5.24, what did he say was crucified? Good job. The flesh. Now, in Romans 6.6, 6, what is he referring to as being crucified? The old man. Here's my question. Listen to me. What is the old man? It's the flesh. So now we have another term in the Bible, a synonym for the sin nature. Guess what it is? The old man. The old man, the flesh, and the sin nature are all referring to the same thing. Does everyone see that? Now, look at what happened to the old man. He was crucified. He is not in process of being crucified. He is not in process of being daily crucified. He is crucified, past tense. Look at what else it says. And the body of sin. Somebody shout, the sin nature. Look at this. The body of sin, look at what happened. It is destroyed. It is not in process of being destroyed. It is, definite article, destroyed. Listen to me. For those of you who belong to Christ, you are the righteousness of God. You have a brand new man living in you, and that new man is Christ. The fullness of the Godhead, Father, Spirit, uh, and son are living in you right now. Amen. You do not have a sin nature. Well, if this is true, which it is, why then do we still sin? That's a great question. If, 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 if the sin nature, the flesh, the old man, the body of sin, all these terms used to describe the sinful nature. If, if, these, if this old man was destroyed and crucified, killed, why do we still sin? Listen to me. Because you are three parts in makeup. Now, you don't have to turn here. Well, actually, you should turn here because most people don't know this. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, all the way to your right. 1 Thessalonians, find Colossians, Ephesians, uh, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, I believe is next, right? And then Colossians. Yep, Colossians. And then right after Colossians is 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians, you know, it still blesses me to this day when I see people with an actual Bible. I love the mechanic, uh, mechanical thing, but man, I tell you, to see a Bible... See, this doesn't run out of batteries. Right? You don't have to download a new thing for it. Amen? But you know what? I tell you what, the mechanical Bibles actually help ministers because it lets the people get there quicker. I used to have to turn to everybody's Bible when I first started my Bible study. I had like people in there, I had to go around it because they didn't know any, they never used the Bible. So I had to go to each person, turn their Bible for them, and then come back and, and minister to them. Amen? All right, look at this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. You are three parts in makeup, okay? Look at this. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23. Look at this. And the very God of peace sanctify or separate you wholly. W-H-O-L-L-Y. Not holy, H-O-L-L-Y, but holy speaking W-H-O speaking of the entire being of man, the whole makeup and anatomy of man. Can you see? That's why he's saying W-H-O-L-L-Y, the whole being of man. Now notice what you are comprised of, three parts. Look, spirit, soul, and body. Now listen to me. When you got saved, when you got saved, your spirit is the part that got saved. It's the part that was perfectly forgiven, recreated, and made righteous. Hebrews chapter 12. You don't have to turn there. I'm giving you these notes. You can take them down. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. Your spirit got saved. Now, listen to me. Your flesh, this is, this is so important that you get this. Your flesh, which is the sin nature that lived in you prior to being born again, he trained your soul. 
Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. That's found in Hebrews chapter 4, I think like verse 11 or 12. Your soul is your mind, will, and emotions. So listen, that old man, the, the sin nature, the body of sin, the flesh, he trained your soul, your mind. He taught you how to think. He trained your emotions. He cultivated your affection, what you like, the thing you have an a, a appetite for. He, he trained that in you. And he affected your will, the things that you are intent on doing. He, he, he trained it. He exercised and impressed his influence on your soul. Now, your body simply expressed what was in your mind. So the, follow the, follow the, you know, let me get, uh, I need three guys. Uh, come up here real quick, guys. Three of you, come up here real quick. I want to make sure I paint this illustration. Come quickly, quickly. All three of you, stand right here. All right, I want to make sure you get this. Okay, come stand over here, Nathan. All right, so let's say Nathan is the spirit, okay? Nathan's the spirit, man, all right? Now remember the order, 1 Thessalonians, I need to be in the camera shot. Now remember the order, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I pray God your whole WH, meaning entire, what's first? Spirit, what's second? What's third? Okay, spirit, soul, body. Now listen, when, 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 when he, when, before we got saved, this, our spirit was dead. Meaning, death in the Bible means separation. It was separated from God's influence. It had no influence from God whatsoever. It was a fallen nature right this old man without any influence from god was influencing the soul no influence from god which is why you think ungodly you feel have feelings that don't line up with god's feelings and you have a will intense intentions that are not lined up with the bible because he put that in that man is everybody with me? He influenced the soul, the mind, the will, the emotions. Now, the body simply is like a, a glove. The glove, my hand inside of that glove, the, if I move my hand, then the glove appears to have life. If I take my hand out of the glove, the glove has no life. The body is simply expressing what the old man taught the soul to do and the soul is what enabled the body to express those actions because as a man thinketh so is he the soul part is what causes you to be who you are your soul is the part that gives color to your life it's the part we interact with it's your personality that's your soul your soul, the part of you that gave color to your life, got all of its impression from this man who did not know God. He was dead, separated. Dead doesn't mean cessation of life. That's how we use it. In our modern society, if, if you say something's dead, it's done. No, in the Bible, death means separate. This guy had no influence from God whatsoever. He's completely ungodly. And he was training this man for 30, 40. Some of you got saved, you were 30, 20 something. You had already gone through your whole life drinking, smoking, acting like a fool, you know, loosey booty. You know, you were just doing all kind of stuff. And then all of a sudden you, but see, you, that man, this man taught him that stuff. You, you follow me? So that's what you did. Man, you know, on Friday night, I go to the club. This is what we do. I move on, you know, I put the smooth on this shorty. Or, you know, a girl, you know, you know, if he buys me dinner in the movie, then, you know, I'm going to drop my drawers for him, you see? So you, you were trained in that. Now you get saved. This guy is done. Go sit down, Nathan. Thank you. Lavelle, come here. This guy's done. He's no more. He was destroyed, right? 
He was crucified, right? He's dead. There is no more of him. Now we got a brand new man on the inside. See, we saved you for last because see how big and see, this is tall, dark, handsome, powerful. You might be five feet on the outside, but you're six, five on the inside. So now Christ is living in you. The hope of glory. God is in every one of you right now. But your soul still has all of that old information. This guy did not get saved. We're going to show you that today. He did not get saved at salvation. This, those two were changed out. Wow. Nathan is not living here with Lavelle. See, that's what the church says. The church tells you Nathan and Lavelle are right here. You're, 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 you're schizophrenic on the inside. You got two people living on, on the inside. That's not true. He's done. Crucified. Destroyed. Done. Only Lavelle is here. But the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions still has 20, 30 years of information. How I treat women. How I respond if somebody does something to me. What I do on the workplace. How I handle my money. If I'm a woman, how I respond to a man. What I do in these situations. He cultivated that. So when you get saved, even though this new man is in here, this guy still has all the old download. You have to now upload new information. That's, right. That's called the renewing of the mind. That's why you go to church. You don't go to church to affect this man. Jesus affected this man the moment you were born again. There's nothing we can do to affect this man. He's perfectly holy. Hebrews 12, 24. You go to church to watch over your, my job is to watch over your soul. It's to help you get new information from this, to this man. Amen. Amen? Amen. Now, follow me now. Vernetta asked me this question two weeks ago. This man is giving information to, to, to the soul. He is impressing the soul. Just like the old man did. But, Vernetta asked me, she said, why is it that it seems like we have to put so much effort into, we still like live the old man. You still can see the old man. But when, before we got saved, we didn't have to try to do anything. That was a great question. That's a great question. Here's why. Because when Nathan was here, Nathan was in you since conception. In the womb. He was in you. Then you came out and he was in no influence from, from God. He's influencing your soul. He had first dibs on your soul. He had your soul was blank. It was a blank canvas. He had a paintbrush. He could do whatever he want. Now we got a, a the Holy Spirit has a canvas full of full of stuff that shouldn't be on there. So now he has to come in and erase that and paint a new picture but you got strongholds already in your mind you lived there 20 years you don't just break that way of thinking everybody follow me yes, so there's a process to bring this down and renew it with new information everybody with me okay so this man now is living in you the new man the soul still has all the old information if I want my life physically Damien my body not just my body but the body speaks of the physical realm if i want my physical realm my finances my relationships my career my emotions my, my not my emotions but the result of my like what happens in my marriage what happens with my kid if i want this to change if i want my life out here to change this man has to start being influenced by the mind of the spirit if this man still keeps Nathan's mindset, wow. this man will still be dead. You're still going to produce separation from God. Not that God isn't with you, but you're not going to, you're, you're going to live a life separate than what the word promises. You're not going to see the word manifest. Do you, does everyone understand that? So the most important thing after we switch out Nathan and Lavelle that you can do is renew this man he's the middle piece as he goes this is how Damien's gonna go Damien is just the glove the Bible calls him a suit like an earth suit 
like a shirt. The Bible actually calls Damien clothes that we'll put on new clothes when we get a new body. It's, he's just clothing for the spirit. So he's just a reflection of what's going on with as a man. It's Marvin, guys. As Marvin goes, you will prosper and you will be healthy as your soul prospers. As Marvin goes, Damien will go. If Marvin goes this way, Damien goes that way. If Marvin goes this way, Damien goes this way. If, the, if, if Lavelle is trying to tell Marvin, hey, you know, if somebody cuts you off in traffic, you don't flip him the bird anymore, buddy. And you say, no, that's what I do. If you resist it, then you're gonna, he's going to just keep flipping the bird every day, <laughs> flipping the bird. Now, if, 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 Mar if, Marvin's, if, if Lavelle is saying, listen, when we, when we take a lady out and we're dating, we don't have sex before marriage. Don't, don't, don't try to get that from her just because you bought her something, c cotton candy, at the Rays game. Now, this guy is saying, no, I bought you cotton candy <laughs> at the Rays game. And I took you to the Rays game. So we know what's supposed to And now, the woman's mind is like, he bought me cotton candy at the Rays game, and he took me to the Rays game. So now he's trying to tell him, no, we don't do that, buddy. Relax. Relax. Now, if he'll listen, Damien's body will follow. It's this man. As this man goes, so goes Damien. In your life, listen to me, wherever you are right now, whatever you're reflecting, whether it's positive or negative, it's because of the way you're thinking. Wow. And if you can change this man, which you're doing, you're coming to church, you're logging in online, you're doing it. As you do this, as you keep giving this man new information, this man, your physical experience is going to dramatically change. Amen? Does everybody see that? Okay, give, the, give them a round of applause. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate that. All right. Now. Now. <clears throat> All right, I want you to turn with me now to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. And I want you to look with me at verse 22. Now I'm going to show you in the Bible everything we just illustrated up there for you to see. Ephesians 4. Verse 22. All right. Okay, now watch this. I'm going to show you in Scripture everything that we illustrated up here for you to see. Watch this, verse 22. He says, Put off concerning the former conversation. Now, conversation in the Bible isn't talking about your, your rhetoric, but it's talking about a lifestyle. Your, your lifestyle, okay? Your lifestyle is speaking. Your actions are talking. Amen? And so notice what he says. Put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. Now, these are born-again people. But the old man is still manifesting. The old man would be the sin nature or the flesh, right? He's still manifesting. Now, why is he still finding expression? Look at this, verse 23. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Can you see why the old man is still manifesting? Because the mind, the, Marvin... The soul wasn't renewed yet. Everybody see that? So until this man changes, <coughs> Damien cannot change. Can everybody see that? All right. Now, watch this, verse 24. But what happens if I renew Marvin, the soul, the mind? What happens if I renew him? Look at this. And I will put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. If I will allow Marvin to be impacted by Lavelle, no longer by Nathan, the spirit versus the flesh, then Damien now will start living in joy, peace, prosperity, health, abundance. Everybody see that? It's all about the, the mind, the soul. Um, let me show you one more verse, and this will lead us into our next point. Go to James 1. That's all the way to the back after Hebrews. James chapter 1. 
and I want you to look with me at verse 18. James 1, verses 18, and we're going to read three verses there. James 1. All right, now watch this. James 1, 18. Okay, look at this. This is a very, very significant passage of Scripture. These three verses are very significant because you're going to see where the residue of that sinful nature. Nathan, you're going to see that Marvin is still being impacted. The soul is still being impacted by Nathan's presence, by the flesh. Nathan is not there, but his impression, his influence is still resident in Marvin until you renew it. That's the first thing you're going to see. The second thing you're going to see is that your soul, Marvin, the mind, the will, the emotions, was not saved when you got saved. That's huge that you understand it. Only your spirit was saved. Watch this, James 1, 18. Of his own will, he begot us with the word of truth. Who is James writing to here? Listen, people who were, who were begotten from the word of truth. You know, who, you know what it means to be begotten from the word of truth? It means you're born again. To, to, be, to be begotten means you're born. You are born from God's word. He's writing to people who are born again. That's significant because they're still living ungodly even though they're born again. And we're going to find out why. Watch this. Of his own will, he begot us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. People say, well, first fruits isn't for us to give in the New Testament. God's still giving a first fruit. You couldn't have been born again if God didn't believe in first fruits. That's another subject for another day. I don't have time for See, something doesn't, a scripture doesn't have to say money for it to be talking about principles. First fruit is not a money principle, but it does include money. It's a, it's a kingdom principle. You understand? All right, now watch this. Verse 19, wherefore, my beloved brethren, look at there. Who are these? Brothers, beloved of God. Look at this. My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God, or that's not your nature anymore, to be wrathful. Look at this. Verse 20, 21. Now, here's the money verse. Look at this. Therefore, lay apart all filthiness. So they're living a filthy, unclean life. Yet they're born again. We've all been there. They're living a filthy, unclean life. But the Bible says they're born of the word of truth. They're brothers. They're beloved. God still loves them. Your sin doesn't change God's heart toward you, but it's going to affect your experience in the earth. But it doesn't change God. God has already dealt with your sin. He, they're still beloved and they are born again. But we can't hardly tell. Look, fil they're living filthy. If they weren't living filthy, he wouldn't have to say lay it apart. He's saying stop it. We don't say lay it apart today. This is old King James. We just say stop living like that. So they're, they're living ungodly. Now, why? Look, why? And lay apart all filthiness. Look at this. And superfluity. Now, we don't have no idea. Great job. Uh, sure, we have no idea what superfluity is. Now, I don't have the time to show you this, but if you, look, if you look up this word superfluity with a concordance, the Greek word superfluity here is literally the word residue and remains of the sin nature. You see, because people say, no, the, no the, the, we, we don't have any residue. Let, no, the Bible is telling you that there is still a residue or an influence that Nathan left on Marvin. He left it there. Even though he's gone, his presence in your life is still felt in the, the mind, the will, and the emotions. Are you with me? So the Bible calls this superfluity. Now, where does this superfluity or where does this residue and remains of the sin nature, where does it live? Look. Good job, Marvin. Look. 
in the soul. Look, I'm, all I'm trying to do is show you in the Bible everything we illustrated here because people don't know. People don't, you don't talk in old King James. So when you read this stuff, you just skip past this. You don't even know what this is talking about. Super flu, what? We don't, we don't realize it. Here, look at, look at where this, look at where this superfluity is living. Watch. Superfluity, uh, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word. Now, where is this superfluity living? Where is this residue living? Look, which is able to save your soul. Where is the residue and the remains, the superfluity living? It's in the soul. And here's what James says, to deal with the superfluity or the residue of this sin nature, you need to start receiving the word so it can save your soul. Can you see that? So listen to me, folks. What happens if you don't receive the word, but you're a Christian? I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. Nothing. You're not going to express anything of your new nature, and you're not going to see the word produce any results in your life. Somebody says, prove it. Do you see the word naughtiness there? It says, lay apart all superfluity and naughtiness. Can everybody see? Naughtiness comes after superfluity. Can you see that? Do you know what naught means? See, when we use naught today in modern society, it means, you know, like a, mis like a snot-nosed kid. Misbehaving. Naughty. You're naughty. Naught literally means nothing. Nothing. Naught. For naught, for nothing, for naught, for nothing. Or we could say it this way, worthless. Like if you tell a child, hey, you're acting naughty, you're saying you're acting worthless. There's no profit in acting that way. You're acting, you're not, pr listen to me, folks. Here's what I want you to get. When you let the residue of the, the superfluity, which is the sin nature, that's what he's referring to, the residue of that sin, the flesh. When you let that the, the old man still live. When you let the flesh find expression, that superfluity flow, you're not going to produce anything. Your life is not going to profit anything. It's not going to. And I'm telling you, I'm totally convinced that this is where the average Christian is living because they are not receiving the word to save their soul. Let me tell you what else they're not doing. There's twofold. Many Christians are receiving God's word. But let me tell you what they aren't doing after they leave here on Sunday. Or I should say church, after they leave church on Sunday. Here's what they aren't doing. Look at what follows right after renewing the mind or saving the soul. Look at this, verse 22. And be doers of the word. Not hearers only, for you are only deceiving yourself. You're gonna, you know what it means to deceive yourself? You're living a lie. God's word is true. Your life doesn't look like the word. It doesn't look like the truth. It's a lie. But you're saved. Folks, this is powerful. He's telling you the two-step process of getting Damien to reflect Lavelle being in his life now. The two-step process of getting the, the, the body, the physical experience, to reflect the fact that Jesus, the new man, is in you. It's not just hearing the word. You need to receive the word, but then you need to start doing the word. That's how you retrain your mind, by acting on the word. Now, if you preach that today in the average church, they're going to make the sign of the cross and say, you're preaching the law. We don't need to do anything. It's done. It's done. Lavelle's there. But Marvin still has the superfluity from Nathan. And so the way, the way I change that is I start, uh, I start, at, go to Romans 6 real quick, quickly. Go to Romans 6. Romans 6. Okay, watch this. Romans 6, 
verse 12. When you have it, say, I have it. Oh, my gosh. All right, Romans 6, verse 12. When you have it, say, I have it. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body, that you should obey the lust thereof. Now, how am I going to keep, how am I going to affect my physical experience? How am I going to let not sin reign? How am I going to get rid of this, the, the residue of the sin nature? Look at what he says. Verse 13, neither yield your members, talking about your body, neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself to God or to Lavelle, the new man. Listen to that impulse, the witness of the Holy Spirit. You know, when Damien was doing corporate prayer, he brought up, he said, you know, if you feel something from the Spirit of God, act on that. That's what this is saying. Yield yourself to God as alive from the dead and your members as righteousness unto God. For sin does not have dominion over you anymore. Except you let it. It doesn't have dominion over you anymore. Amen? All right, now. Everybody with me now, right? Okay. Go back to James 1. All right. Now, here's our next point. That was all point one. Let's, we got to move through this quickly because I only have 16 minutes and 50 seconds, okay? Now I'm going to stop when this alarm goes off. Now, just flow with me, okay? Pay attention and listen fast. How do we allow the flesh to live? How do we allow the flesh to live? The flesh is dead as in the sin nature. It's dead. But the residue, the superfluity, the remains is still in my soul. Everybody saw that, correct? James 1, 21. We saw that, right? How do I let the flesh live? Now, I want you to hear me here. If you didn't, this is all new. This is brand new. Everything else that we've said, we said in the last three weeks. We just keep hammering it home because you, this is the last time we'll teach it, but you need to get that. You are born again. You are not a sinner. You are the righteousness of God. And if you are misbehaving or living a filthy life, not just morally, but your life doesn't look like the word, it's, it's not because you don't have the goods to produce the word. It's because your soul is not renewed. You can change that by, start, by receiving the word to save the soul. And as your soul prospers, you will prosper and be in health. There is no doubt in that statement. Third John 2, beloved, that's me. I wish, here's God's desire for me, that you, above all, that you prosper and be healthy. Now, how's it going to come? Even as your soul prospers. So the soul has to get the word. You can control. You are as prosperous as you want to be. You are as healthy as you want to be. Let me say it this way. If you're sick, now, I know this is going to, no, that's not why I'm sick, Drell, it's my DNA. It's not true. No, I'm sick because, you know, I, I encountered this person that had the virus. It's not true. You will prosper and be healthy. What does he link it to? Your diet, your DNA? No, the way you think. If you thought in harmony with the word of God, there's no sickness that could live in your body. Now, we're not there yet. I'm not saying I'm there. I'm saying this is what we can produce. We have the goods. We just have to align with what we have and start acting like it's so. You can't sit there and act sick after hearing healing scriptures and think you're going to be healthy. You've got to start acting. If you want to prosper, you can't act poor and expect to prosper. You've got to act like a prosper. You've got to do the word and hear the word, and then you'll manifest it. Now, how do we allow the flesh to live? I want you to hear me good. Please hear me, okay? How do we allow the flesh to live? We allow the flesh to live when we fail to receive the word of God. We know that, right? J James 1, 18, 21. Receive 
the engrafted word that's able to save your soul and then start doing that word. And then we'll put aside all of that stuff that's not like the Bible. We'll start uh, uh, producing the promises of God, right? All right, now, now listen now. What's the posture that you have to be in to receive the word? Let me say it another way. We allow the flesh to live when we fail to receive the word of God. Let me say it to you this way. How do we fail to receive the word of God? Hearing the word is not the same as receiving the word. Hold on, Vernetta. In the parable of the sower, all four of the grounds heard the word. Right? In the parable of the sower, even wayside heard the fowl took it away. Right? It's not about hearing. The gospel is going forth. You're attending church. You're getting the word. Listen to me. Listen to me. My goodness, man. This is, we, this is a whole Sunday I could teach on this right here, but I don't have time. Listen to me. How do we fail to receive the word? Listen to me. When you fail to humble yourself. Man, this is huge. You fail to receive the word when you fail to humble yourself. Or let me put it another way, when you're prideful. Now, I know many of you in here would say, I'm not prideful. I'm going to show you what pride looks like and what it looks like to not humble yourself. I'm going to show you. Let's first prove that when you don't humble yourself, neither can you receive. And if you don't receive, the soul can't be saved. And if the soul can't be saved, then that old man, Nathan, is still going to, even though he's seated and Lavelle is standing up, it's still going to look like Nathan's in your life because Marvin has nothing else to draw from. Wow. All right, so let's show you. James 1.18, look at what he says, verse 21. James 1, verse 21. James 1, verse 21, look at what he says. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul when is our soul saved let's go backwards now let's read the verse backwards when is our soul saved when we receive the engrafted word right how do we receive the engrafted word what's the posture we have to be in in order to receive god's word we have to be meek that's humble. He's talking about humility listen to me without humility you can't receive the word he didn't say hear the word you're hearing, but are you receiving? Let me say it another way. Are you humbling yourself? Because until you humble yourself, even though you're hearing the word, you won't receive it. Your soul won't be saved as a consequence, and that old man is going to still live. This is how we allow the flesh to live. We do not humble ourselves. Now, how... How, listen to me, how do we humble ourselves? Or how do we receive with meekness the word? How do we humble ourselves? Listen to me. We humble ourselves by submitting to the word of God. The average Christian does not do this. That's why the next verse in James, he says, start doing the word or submit to it. Go to, go to 1 Peter 5, all the way to your right. 1 Peter 5. Me and clocks don't get along. First Peter five, quickly, please. First Peter five. First Peter five. Okay, so I want to make sure you follow me. Listen, if we want to save our soul, we have to receive God's what? Word. Everybody follow me? Yes. Now, what's the posture that we need to be in in order to receive the word of God? Humility. We receive the word with meekness or humility. Listen to me, if you aren't humble, you aren't receiving the word. You're here, we didn't say hearing, you're hearing. But you're not, it's not going down without humility. And if the word isn't going down, neither is the soul being saved. And if the soul isn't being saved, listen to me, I don't mean this to hurt you, listen to me, you will not prosper and you will not be in health. Your life is going to be naughty. Nothing that the word promises. It's going to have something, but nothing good. No good thing is in the flesh. So if you let Nathan live, your life is not going to have any good thing. Is everybody with me? 
Okay, now, how do we humble ourselves? Look at this, 1 Peter 5. I'm going to read from verse 1 through verse 6 for context to show you that we humble ourselves to the word, okay? To the word. Now, you're going to see in here pastors. You're going to see in here pastors. I want everybody to listen to me, please, because I, 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 I thought very strongly if I wanted to put all of this in here for context sake. Now, please listen to me. You're going to see in here the under shepherd and the pastor preaching and teaching the word. He's going to tell you to submit to him, but it's really not to him. It's to his place in your life. To feed you it you know like people use this to dominate and control people that's not what we're saying here we are saying that my job is to feed I mean Damien gave me a wonderful introduction I've never had an introduction like that in my life you know it was a great introduction but my, you're not submitting to me you're submitting to the anointing on this house and you're submitting to the word of God that God just happens to be using me to do it for you. Amen. But it's not me. You're submitting to the word that's coming through your pastor. If I'm your pastor, if not, no problem. Now watch this. First Peter five. Look at verse one. The elders which are among you. That's the pastors. Everybody see that? The elders which are among. Now, this is not talking about age you're going to see younger you're going to see elder this is not talking about physical age because i'm younger than all of you timothy was younger than all of them he even wrote let no man despise your youth so he was young he's not talking about age he's talking about rank position there are some who who god calls to put in in the, in the church leadership position there are some that are to submit to that leadership position he calls those youngers, he calls the ones responsible for leading the el like a parent, the elder, the father. Are you with me? Okay, now, watch this. The elders which are among you, I exhort. I am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also I'm a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God. Do what to the flock? Feed. Not entertain them. Feed the flock that is among you, taking oversight not by constraint, but willingly. You want to do it. You love them. Not for filthy lucre, because of your, the advantages that come with the office, which we aren't there yet. But he's saying, don't do that. Watch this. And be of a ready mind. Your mind needs to be sober. Don't be off up here. Neither, look at this. Here's where a lot of preachers miss it. Neither as being lords over God's heritage. Don't dominate them. Don't be domineering to them. Serve them. Now look, and be an example to the flock. You know, when I share with you my life, the good things, even the bad things that I deal with and that I work through, you know I'm not sharing those things to boast in me, but I'm sharing them to boast of God. I'm using it as an example just to show you that this is where we are and here's where we came through the word and and to some degree we have some knowledge to help you in, in your life okay so be examples to the flock now look at this and when the chief shepherd shall appear you will receive a crown of glory that fades not away I'm looking forward to that day verse 5 likewise so just as the pastor needs to submit to God not serving out of an unready mind not serving for filthy lucre not serving to dominate the people. He needs to submit to God's standard of the pastoral office. So do the members need to have order. Now watch. 
Likewise, you younger, submit yourself to the elder. Is it really the elder or is it to the assignment on the elder? It's the feeding. Submit to the word. The elder feeds the flock. What do you need to submit to? That feeding of the word. Are you with me? You need to submit yourself to the word of God. Now watch this. All of you be subject one to another. Now notice what he calls submission. Look at this. And be clothed with humility. Notice what he calls humility. To submit to the word of God. To submit to the word of God. That's humility. Look at this, what he says. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Look at verse 6. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Listen to me, folks. In order to save your soul, you have to receive the word. But in order to receive the word, you have to humble yourself. How do you know when you're humbling yourself? Are you submitting to God's word? Are you doing what the word says? Or are you a hearer only? And this is where the average, more than average, this is where most Christians miss it. They do not let the word of God dominate them. Their feelings are going to make the final decision. Their view are going to make the final decision. What they feel about the pastor is going to make their final decision. Their opinion, their mom and them is going to make the final decision. Culture, pop culture is going to make the final decision. God's word in the average Christian's life does not have first place. And this is why naughtiness is in so many of our lot nothingness we're not producing it's not because we don't have the goods and it's not because we aren't hearing Renee we are not humbling we are not doing and submitting to the Word of God we're not doing it it doesn't matter what you see in the Bible if I don't feel like that I'm not gonna do it doesn't matter what God says I'm supposed to do in my marriage if she pisses me off and doesn't make my rice right, we're going to have a problem. Doesn't matter what, this, what God says I'm supposed to do, forgive. If they do this to me, here's how I'm going to handle them. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter how I date. I got to try it out first before I buy it. Doesn't matter. I don't care what God says. This is what I'm going to do. This is my marriage. Spanking. God says to rear up a child by spanking them. Everybody, all the parent magazines will tell you, you're going to damage the child for life. But God said spank them. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from them. He'll say, I'm dying. Believe him not. It's in the Bible. Parents don't do that. My own wife's parents, they they'll, they'll, at one time, they never tried to talk to me again, but they'll... All right, I've got to stop. I guess that was a good place, right? The Lord, before I get in trouble with my mother-in-law, right? <laughs> All right, every head bowed. Did you guys get anything out of that today? Okay, we'll pick up next week with point three, and then we'll move into our next phase. We'll be ready to go. Point three is what happens when we let the flesh live, okay? So I only have two things to show you there, and then we're going to move into the type of the flesh, and we're going to get this thing cooking, okay?